so so that means that means that um, whoops I lost it there there we go okay so so you know you've got dogs and cats and 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 other types so that means that the mustelids are more closely associated with dogs okay so that's they're in the suborder caniformia. Uh, the family Mustelidae is the largest family of carnivores. Um, there's currently 66 species that are extant, which means living, and two recent extinctions, unfortunately. Um, and I'll mention them later. Um, currently, there's eight subfamilies recognized and 22 genera. Um, the, I was wondering the family name, uh, what was the origin of it? And the origin is from the word Mustela, which is the Latin for weasel. Um, and the uh, diminutive form of mus is, is um, Latin for mouse, okay? So from antiquity, in other words, from earliest recorded time, weasels have been identified as catchers of mice, okay? So that's basically the origin of the word mustelid. So here's a really interesting diagram here of mustelid phylogenetics. So basically, this is looking at how are all of the mustelids related to each other, okay? So you can see that we've got on the left, you've got that nice diagram and you've got, you could see six different colors there on the left. And then down at the bottom, I call your attention to the last two names that don't have color on them at all, okay? Those are two other subfamilies, okay? So you can see on the right here, I've got a list and so you could see you've got the otter subfamily, you've got the weasels and mink subfamily, you've got the, um, the, the grisons and the polecats as a subfamily, you've got the ferret badgers as a subfamily, uh, martins, wolverines, teras as a subfamily, uh, the European badgers as a subfamily, and there's more than one species there. And then the last two are what are considered monotypic, which means they only have one member in that group, okay? So the um, Melivorne is the honey badger, the all famous honey badger, which I, I have a picture of at the end, I'll show you. Um, and then Taxidine Day is the, um, is the American badger. And so those are the only representatives of those subfamilies. So you can see how they're divided out. And also look at, when you look at the slide, look at the body form. You can see their body form, they're long, and narrow. They have uh, fairly, they have medium to long tails. Uh, so we're going to look at some of these life history traits here. Um, so they, they, they have the elongated body form, they have short legs, they have short rounded ears, and generally very thick fur. Um, the anal scent glands are a, a, a noteworthy trait that all mustelids have. Okay, so they have a pair of anal scent glands um, and they're used for marking territory and also for um, signaling between males and females and between males and other males or females and other females. Um, they all exhibit delayed implantation, which is really interesting. Okay, so gestation period is short, but they can extend it up to a year. And the beauty of that adaptation is, is that Given the environmental conditions, implantation can, can be made to happen. So it's a delay that's waiting. The female is waiting for the environment to be just right to be able to give birth. And so they can, they can prolong the gestation period by up to a year, which is really interesting. Um, and, and generally what that means is, is that they can, uh, the implantation can occur at a time when there might be enough prey to be able to take care of the, the needs of the young. Uh, mustelids have a strong sexual dimorphism, which means the males are larger than the females in this case. And it's not just a little bit larger, they're a lot larger, okay? Uh, most of these, most mustelids are solitary. Uh, they're, they're nocturnal generally. Um, there's a couple of exceptions, like sea otter is not, is not nocturnal, sea otter is diurnal, uh, but most of them are solitary, most of them are nocturnal and active year round. Um, they're mainly carnivorous, um, but not all the time, but mainly. 
Um, the dentition is adapted for eating. They have a, a carnassial pair of teeth, which is, um, which is a, an upper and a lower uh, set of, of tooths of teeth that um, are for shearing meat. Okay, so they basically act like scissors. Um, guilds exist, and what I mean by that is you have, you have uh, different size weasels, you have different size martens and fishers, and um, the larger ones, if you have a guild like that where you've got the large weasel, the medium weasel, and the small weasel, the larger ones can kill the smaller ones and eat the smaller ones, okay? So fishers uh, will kill and eat martens, and long-tailed weasels will kill short-tailed weasels and leaf weasels, and short-tailed weasels can kill leaf weasels, okay? So, so these ecological guilds that we have um, are, are such that you've got a hierarchy of, of uh, power, basically. The larger ones are, are, are more dominant over the smaller ones. Uh, Mustela niches, they have some very interesting niches. Uh, some Mustelas are arboreal. They live in, they, they, they um, occupy trees a lot. Fishers, Martins, and Terras are examples of that. Um, they're excellent climbers. Um, I don't know if any of you have ever seen any of these in trees. I've seen fishers in trees uh, up in uh, west, southwestern Pennsylvania, and it's really cool to see that. Uh, Semi-aquatic. So mink and otters are semi-aquatic. So they spend a lot of their time in the water, um, but they're still adept on land also. They can still move around well on land. Uh, some are marine. So we have sea otters are marine, and the sea mink used to be marine. The sea mink is extinct, and I'll talk about that later. Uh, some mustelids are fossorial, which means they're diggers. So they're gonna be in the ground. So badgers, ferrets, and to some extent, weasels are fossorial. Um, weasels are fossorial because they go into, they, they enter burrows of their prey all the time. So they could spend a lot of time in the burrows. Uh, so, uh, and then some are subnivian. So what that means is, under the snow, okay? So when, they're, um, when you have a situation where there's snow, a lot of snow, like in the Arctic, uh, weasels can spend a lot of their activity time just moving around under the snow, hunting for small mammals. And they actually will uh, breed in the winter under the snow, and they will make dens for breeding lined with the hair of their, of their prey. So that's the only way they can do it. They basically have to insulate the den from or with the, with the fur of their prey in order to be able to breed. And they can do that successfully in you know, northern Canada, northern Alaska. So fossil record, uh, mustelids appeared in the late Oligocene in Eurasia. That's the first record that we have of mustelids. They migrated to every continent except Antarctica and Australia. Uh, they mainly reached Western Hemisphere uh, via the Bering Land Bridge, but not all of them did, but, but many of them did. And they've been widely introduced globally, all continents except Antarctica. And so uh, weasels were introduced into New Zealand, for example, least weasels and uh, short-tailed weasels. Uh, mink have been widely introduced all over the globe. There's mink farms all throughout Europe and Asia. Um, as well as uh, North America, and uh, mink were introduced into Patagonia also. So they are, they are represented all over the world except for Antarctica. So here's a species of mustelids that occur in North America. And the ones with the asterisk, those are the ones that occur in Maryland. Okay, so we have least weasel, mustela nivalis, short-tailed weasel, mustela arminia, long-tailed weasel, mustela frenata, uh, the mink, uh, mustela or neovisin visin, uh, sea mink, again, mustela or neovisin macrodon, and black footed ferret, mustela nigropes. Um, one thing to mention here, what, as I have these scientific names up, is that the taxonomy for mustelids is very unsettled. Okay, and so people are proposing different genus names 
and things like that. And so some of these are not fully accepted and uh, nobody's done a complete treatment of all the mustelids. Um, there's been some scattered molecular work done, uh, but it's kind of a mess and it really needs to be teased out. And so I, I, I think that some of these names are not accepted by a lot of people. So uh, I just I point that out that the that the taxonomy is is kind of uh, mixed up. Okay, here's the rest of the North American mustelids. You have the river otter, Lotra canadensis, that occurs in Maryland, sea otter, and Hydrolutris, that of course does not occur here. American martin, Martis americana, does not occur here. It used to occur here. It doesn't occur here now. Um, the Fisher, Martis or Pacania Penante, that one occurs in Western Maryland. American Badger, Taxidia Taxis. Uh, Wolverine, Gulo Gulo. Uh, the Terra, Ira Barbara. And, and the Greater Grison, Galictus Vitata. The, those last two are more tropical. So they uh, technically occur in North America, but they don't occur in the US. Okay, so they occur in Central America, which is te technically part of North America. So here's our first one up here, the least weasel, Mustela nivalis. This is the smallest carnivore in the world. Um, the the species, I mean, the uh, subspecies of least weasel we have in North America is the small form. There's there's several different size forms across the globe. Um, and here's their range, North American range, right here. So you can see that that they occur mainly in Canada and Alaska. Um, their, their numbers are higher as you go further north. So in the areas in, in uh, northern Canada and Alaska, you can see a higher, higher numbers. Um, the numbers in the U.S. are generally pretty low, um, but they do occur at higher elevations through the Appalachians. They do occur in Maryland and Pennsylvania, and you can see they go all the way over to the Great Plains. Um, and they, they are holarctic. Okay, they're circumpolar and whole Arctic. So they occur across the world um, in the Northern Hemisphere, very wide distribution. So they actually occur um, across Europe and Asia, all the way uh, to Japan, and then all the way down to so Southeast Asia. Um, they occur in uh, India and the Middle East, and they also occur in North Africa, all the way across from Morocco to Egypt. So they're a very, very um, widely distributed. They are, there's a lot of geographic variation. As I mentioned, uh, the small form occurs in North America. Medium and large forms occur in the other parts of the world. Um, they're active year round. And like I mentioned, they breed under the snow in the winter in the Arctic. Um, the pelage of the Northern populations turns white in the, win in the winter time. Um, and you can imagine what kind of uh, effects climate change is having on that. I just saw a paper this week talking about um, mismatch, but climate change is causing a mismatch. And so they're having a, the, the weasels are showing that there's a mismatch there because the snow is not there anymore uh, where it used to be. Um, pell let's see, um, no black tip on the tail. So these guys are small. Um, so the ones that would occur in Maryland are probably about maybe six inches long and they weigh about the same, uh, the same weight as a golf ball. You think about that. That's the size. That's how small they are. So they don't have a black tip on their tail. And the other weasels, the larger weasels do have a black tip on their tail. So the reason that the least weasel doesn't have one is because it doesn't. It wouldn't make any evolutionary sense for it to have one. See, the idea for a black tip on the tail is to um, confuse and turn the uh, attention of the predator towards the tip of the tail. Okay, so the longer, the larger weasels with the longer tails, they have the black tip because that can be effective as a way to deter predation. The predator, the predator will be attracted to the movement of the black on the tail. But the least weasel is too small for that. And so there's no black tip on the tail there because that wouldn't serve the purpose. 
Um, their diet, they pretty much eat anything. And this is going to be true for most of the mustelids we're talking about here. Small mammals of any kind, mainly mice and voles. Um, they eat small birds and bird eggs, rabbits, uh, moles and shrews, small frogs and salamanders and things like that, insects. And not. I put carrion on there, but that's not really common. Um, the, the weasels in particular, they want fresh prey. And so they will, they will cache prey. In other words, they'll store it away um, in their dens, but they generally don't eat a lot of carrion, if any. They want, they want fresh prey. Um, now that's gonna be different in um, other mustelids as we talk, but I'm just talking about the weasels right now. They like fresh prey. Um, they're fierce predators. They could take prey five to 10 times their weight. Um, there's records, there's plenty of records of least weasels taking rabbits. I think, just think about that for a second. You got this little tiny guy that weighs the, the weight of a golf ball jumping on the back of a rabbit. I mean, that's, that's, that's something to think about. Well, it's, it's a larger cousin here is the long tail weasel. Um, I, I skipped the short tail weasel, not because I don't like it, but because of, of time constraints. I just can't talk about every single one. So a long-tailed weasel is um, a Stella frenata. Um, it is a North American only, well, North America and South America only. It's new world. It's not an old world species. So you can see on the left that it occurs just barely up into Canada uh, and it occurs down into Mexico, Central America. And on the right, you could see how much it occurs in South America. So it extends all the way down uh, through Colombia and down through the Andes in Peru and Bolivia, um, and it's going to occur, right, it's going to have other mustelids down there in South America with it, uh, because the least weasel and the short tail weasel don't occur down there, but they have other weasels that occur in South America. So uh, long tail weasel is Western hemisphere only, um, unlike its other two rel close relatives. It arose in North America. It never crossed the Bering Land Bridge. It has a black tip on its tail. Um, the body's, the fur is kind of a yellowish white on the ventral side, and it's a, a brownish fur on the dorsal side and on the sides. Um, it commonly uses chipmunk holes for burrows. Um, and it lines its nest chamber with grasses and with fur of the prey. So weasels will take the fur and basically pluck the fur off of the skin of the prey and use it as a lining for their nests. Um, prey include, again, it's gonna be similar to least weasel except a little bit larger. So small rodents, squirrels, chipmunks, shrews and moles, rabbits, birds, bird eggs, um, earthworms, insects, and even they're even known to enter um, maternity roost of bats and take bats, which is amazing. And they also cache food. Um, these guys are fearless and aggressive hunters and they will attack animals much larger than themselves. Again, similar to the least weasel and to the short tail weasel. Here's an interesting guy. I decided to throw this one in because for one, it's really interesting and for two, um, they're not common and they're, they're, they're protected by the Endangered Species Act. And this is black-footed ferret, Mostella nigropes. That scientific name nigropes means black foot. Nigra is black and PES is foot. So that, so that name is, is built right into their scientific name. So on the left, I have a uh, former range. So, so you can see the green area on the left is the historic range. So they occurred all the way up into the plains, the, the prairies of uh, Canada, down into uh, Chihuahua and parts of Mexico. And, and it was basically limited to the Great Plains. Um, and you can see also on the left there, the reintroduced areas where they've been reintroduced. And on the right, you could see a more, uh, specific diagram showing the, the uh, reintroduction um, areas. So main, most of the areas are South Dakota, um, Arizona, and Utah. Those are areas where they've got uh, established populations. You can see 
Wait, 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 wait. Why did you go ahead here? It jumped ahead on me there, sorry. Okay, um, you can see on here that there's a Black-Footed Ferret Conservation Center located in Wyoming. Um, and let's see what I wanna mention here. All right, so these guys, I mentioned they're native to the Great Plains of North America. One of their biggest problems was that they are specialists in their diet. 90 to 95% of their diet was prairie dogs. So what happens when you take away the prairie dogs? You take away the black-footed ferrets. And so that's what happened. Population decline started in the 1800s. Prairie dogs were eradicated uh, widely throughout the range. Also, prairie was converted to agriculture during that time. Um, and then they suffered poisoning and hunting and also sylvatic plague. And the sylvatic plague affected mainly the prairie dogs. And so that was another factor that led to the prairie dog decimation that then led to the black-footed ferret decimation. Uh, ferrets were declared extinct in the wild in 1979. Uh, in two years later, a residual population of ferrets, a small one, was found in Matisse, Wyoming. And then uh, the Fish and Wildlife Service started a captive breeding program for them. And they were started to be reintroduced in the early 90s. And they're still being reintroduced today. Um, so they've been reintroduced into eight different Western states, Canada and Mexico. Um, there's the, this. This is the current, the most current numbers I saw were 18 populations. Four of them were self-sustaining. So only four out of 18. Um, and so the self-sustaining ones were located in South Dakota, two in South Dakota, one in Arizona, and one in Wyoming. Um, I, I will mention that um, I did, in case you didn't realize or remember um, from previous talks, um, I spent some years in Stillwater, Oklahoma. And while I was there, Oklahoma was going to take a, uh, a reintroduction of black-footed ferrets out in the panhandle in, in uh, Cimarron County. And uh, one of the largest prairie dog uh, towns in the entire Southern Plains was located out there. It was, it was 10 miles long, 10 miles of, of just straight prairie dog towns. And um, they had the plan all made up, all worked out, ready to go. And sylvatic plague came in and it wiped out all the prairie dogs. And the prairie dogs were gone. And so the, the uh, introduction, the reintroduction was also gone. So it just didn't happen because of sylvatic plague. Uh, so black footed ferrets are protected under the ESA. Um, from the very beginning, 67 was the first, the first ESA. Um, and they were, they were added in 82 because they, they were thought to be extinct. And so they didn't put them on the ESA because you can't, you can't uh, protect something that's extinct. But once they were rediscovered in 81, then they were added to the ESA the next year. Um, IUCN, which is uh, International Union of Conservation of Nature, um, is a very important conservation organization, international. Um, and they listed them as extinct in the wild and then um, after the reintroductions were successful, they, they downlisted them to endangered. Uh, here's the mink. Um, this is Mostella or Neovison bison. Um, and you can see that it looks like a very large weasel, uh, maybe a little stockier. Um, and there's its uh, range in North America. And you can see that it doesn't live in the southwestern part of the US at all. It doesn't occur down into Central America. And it, it's, it does occur in the Arctic, but not as far north as, as the weasels. So, it's, it's, so this mink is native to North America. It's been introduced widely worldwide. Um, it's semi-aquatic. It has a fusiform body form. What that means is fusiform is like torpedo shape. So it's going to move like a torpedo through the water. Okay, um, its fur is very thick and luxurious. It's water resistant. Um, their prey include fish, rodents, crustaceans, frogs, and birds. Um, their territories are generally linear, 
What I mean by that is, is that their territories go along waterways. So they could have a home range. And if you looked at their home range, you'd see that it's going along a line, it's following the waterway. Uh, they move well on water and land. They're able to climb trees very well and they're very good swimmers. Um, fur farming is something that's really big with mink uh, because of the fact they have a luxurious uh, pelt. Um, so in North America and Europe and Asia, um, there are fur farms for mink. They're the most frequently farmed fur of any animal. Um, the, the farm animals are substandard genetically. Um, they have, they, a study was done with them. They have significantly smaller hearts, brains, and um, I can't remember the other organ. So, but brain and heart, uh, much smaller uh, than, than the wild mink. Um, and they've also been uh, selectively bred for different coat colors. Okay, so, um, so in, in fur farms, they're selectively breeding the animals, which is different from the wild. So they're gonna be quite different. And, and by the way, a lot of the fur farm animals escape. And so a lot of the, a lot of animals that, uh, that were bred in the fur farms are running around wild because they, they have a tendency to escape. Um, tox studies, I put this in here because of my experience with this. Um, that means toxicology studies. Michigan State University has a mink facility, a big mink facility. And in 1965, they started using this mink colony to test the safety for eating Great Lakes fish. This was the time of the 60s when people were starting to realize how messed up the Great Lakes were. And so the, you know, the thinking is, well, if the Great Lakes are messed up and people are eating a lot of fish out of it, what kind of effect is that gonna have on people? So they started a mink colony and to my knowledge, they still have it um, and I know, uh, one of the guys that was involved with that place. And I couldn't find the picture he gave me, um, unfortunately, but he showed me a picture with him holding a mink in his hand from the farm that they had there. And the size of the glove he had on was, would just blow your mind. In other words, you're not gonna handle these guys with regular garden gloves or even work gloves. You need to have the extra, extra, extra thick, large gloves to handle these guys. Uh, so, so mink have been very important. So why is that important for tox studies? It's because mink eat fish, okay? And when you're talking about contaminants and fish, you're adding an extra trophic la layer to the whole equation. And so what that means is that you can, um, you can accumulate and concentrate contaminants. And so anything that eats fish is going to be extra sensitive to contaminants. Okay, that's that's why bald eagles and ospreys declined during the uh, during DDT and all of those things because uh, because they're fish eaters. So the fish and pelicans also the fish eaters really took it hard, and so that's why minks were used for this purpose. Now here's a sea mink. This is a larger cousin of the American mink. Uh, Mastella macrodon. Uh, macrodon means, if you look at the word, macro means large and don means tooth. So this is a large tooth mink. Um, there's been no photos ever taken of them and there are, to my knowledge, no complete specimen of this species in existence, unfortunately. Here is its former range. So it ranged from Massachusetts, and this is, we think it did, the records indicate it ranged from Massachusetts all the way up to Newfoundland, but it's, its major part of the range was uh, Maine and New Brunswick. Unfortunately, we don't know very much about these guys. They're extinct in the wild sometime between 1860 and 1920. They were seldom ever seen after 1860. The reason they went extinct, over harvesting. There were no regulations. Their fur was more uh, valuable than American mink by a lot. Um, it had a reddish uh, color to it. And so people really wanted this fur and they basically just hunted them to extinction. 
Um, they're, they're larger than the American mink. Um, like I said, they have a, a reddish fur. Um, it's a stockier uh, body shape. They were reported to have a very pungent fishy odor to them and they had distinct dentition. So they had a, a, a larger and distinct dentition than the American mink. As I mentioned, no complete specimens or photos available. Uh, skull and tooth fragments were found in Native American shell middens. And so that's how a lot of our research has been done on this species. Um, and there's research being done right now uh, using ancient DNA techniques to be able to try to determine if this was actually a real species or whether it was a subspecies of American mink. Okay, so the evidence points to it being a full species. Uh, but there's a, a study that's almost completed right now that is going to say that it's a full species based on the uh, ancient DNA molecular data. So we think that the prey that they, that they ate included crabs, lobsters, mussels, clams, and fish. Um, this species was not fully described by biologists until 1903. So, so you could almost speculate that it was, wasn't described until it was extinct. Um, so full species status is in question, but uh, we think that it's gonna be, it's gonna end up being a full species after all, not a subspecies of American mink. River otter is next, Lantra canadensis. This one occurs in Maryland. And you can see there, see North American range. So they do occur all the way up into Alaska and Northern Canada. Um, they occur in the Southeast. Um, they don't occur in the plains or the Southwest. Uh, and, and also kind of the Ohio Valley. Um, but other than that, um, they have a pretty wide range. Um, they, river otters originated from the old world and the, it's from those otters that crossed the Bering uh, Land Bridge. Uh, they're semi-aquatic, found along waterways and coasts. Uh, so they can be found, you know, off the coast of, uh, of the country. So they can, they can be marine, in other words. Um, they have a fusiform body shape, webbed toes, very thick fur, um, very good insulation and that fur is water repellent. Um, their prey include fish, amphibians, clams, mussels, snails, aquatic invertebrates, uh, turtles, particularly if they're small. Sometimes they will eat waterfowl. I saw some records where they were, they were eating ducks um, and also rails. Um, they don't eat small mammals very much though. Um, so that's, that's kind of unusual because most other mustelids love small mammals. Uh, their range has been significantly reduced due to habitat loss. Um, they're active year round. They're very susceptible to contaminants. And again, the reason is because they eat a lot of fish. Okay, so if, you eat, if you're an animal and you eat a lot of fish, you are going to have contaminant issues. Um, the one really interesting thing about river otters is that they're more social than most mustelids. So they live and hunt together in groups. They share dens together. They share resting sites. They actually have common latrines where they will all um, do their thing in one spot. And they also have aloe grooming, which is very interesting. That's something that you would expect to see in primates. Uh, river otters groom each other, which is really, really cool. Here's the fisher, Martis or Pecania penante. Um, this, this animal occurs in Maryland, among other places. It was reintroduced into West Virginia and it happened to make its way into Maryland. But you can see it's, a, it's an arboreal species. It loves to climb trees. Um, and that bottom diagram on the right there is a fisher climbing a tree there uh, that a camera trap caught a, a photo of. Here's the fisher distribution. It's a North American species only. So it occurs, you can see it occurs in the boreal forest. Basically it's a boreal forest species. Okay, and this map is the most current one I could find. It's a little bit outdated. So um, I would include in here, um, West, Western Pennsylvania and Western Maryland and down into 
the eastern third or so of West Virginia. Okay, so it's so it, it, in other words, the higher elevations of the Appalachians, it occurs there. Okay, but it's occurring there because they were reintroduced. Okay, so the reintroduction caused the range to expand. So the fisher, the name fisher is kind of unusual because they don't fish, they don't eat fish. Um, so it's either from the, Eng the English word fitch, which means polecat, because it looks like a polecat, or it's, it was called a fisher because it looks like a sea mink. It's about the same size as a sea mink, and it's not reddish, but it looks like the same size. So people may have called it a fisher simply because it looks like a sea mink, which was a fisher. Uh, 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 technically, I mean, it was actu an actual animal that ate fish. Um, as I mentioned, it's extirpated from um, a lot of the southern parts of its range, but reintroduced into many places in the U.S., including Maryland, via West Virginia. Um, the West Virginia fishers actually came from New Hampshire. Uh, basically, West Virginia traded for fishers, and in return, they gave New Hampshire turkeys. So I think that was a pretty good deal all, all the way around. Um, but they got released into Tucker and Pocahontas counties. They made their way to Maryland by the early 70s, and they occur in Maryland in uh, Garrett, Allegheny, Washington, uh, Frederick, and there's even possibilities of them being in Carroll County right now. Um, they prefer large tracts of coniferous or mixed hardwood forests with large trees for denning and dense overstory. That's what they like. Um, their prey includes the, the typical smaller mustelid type of uh, prey, any kind of small mammal. Uh, they like squirrels a lot, uh, birds and bird eggs. They will eat carrion sometimes, uh, fruit, beech nuts, frogs, and their specialty is porcupines. Uh, they don't eat fish, uh, but they do like porcupines. Porcupines occur here in Maryland also in the same counties that Fisher occurs. And the, uh, they have a very gruesome uh, predatory technique for porcupines. They can't attack anything on the porcupine except the belly and the face. And so they'll either try to get the porcupine to move where they take their claws and they rip the belly open, or they will just go right at the face and just keep, keep attacking the face um, over and over again. So that's, that's how they do it. They have to get around the quills. Now, this guy is very cool here, the American badger, Taxidia taxis. Um, like I mentioned, this is a monotypic subfamily. It's only one animal in this subfamily, and this is it. Um, and you can see here is the North American range, and, and you can see that it's mainly uh, central and western uh, US species. It does get up into the prairies of Canada. Um, and I imagine it gets down into northern Mexico also, even though this map doesn't show it. Um, it also occurred east, further east, and it's been extirpated from Pennsylvania, and it does occur in Ohio. Uh, so there were records in Maryland also, uh, but they're, they've been long extirpated. Uh, but they do still currently occur in Ohio. Um, these guys are very similar to the European badger in appearance but they're not related. They're not even in the same genus. So they're in the same family, obviously, but they're not in the same genus. They're fossorial. They're adapted for digging. They have very short, powerful legs. Their body form is flattened. So they're not fusiform like the mink and the otter and the weasels. These are flattened body shapes. Um, they have very large foreclaws, uh, many inches long that are very helpful in their digging. Um, their habitats open grasslands with available prey. What they need is colonial skyurids. And what that means is prairie dogs, ground squirrels, um, any kind of squirrel that lives in a colony. That's what they want. Um, so they're going to be eating fossorial rodents, pocket gophers, ground squirrels, prairie dogs, um, other rodents, uh, skunks. They will prey on skunks, uh, snakes. They're especially good at, at killing and eating rattlesnakes. Uh, ground nesting birds, unfortunately, one of my favorite ground nesting birds is one of their prey items, and that is the burrowing owl. 
Um, also, uh, other herbs, uh, carrion, uh, insects, and some, on occasion, some plants and fungi. Interestingly, they are known to cooperatively hunt with coyotes. And I've seen video of this before. I don't know if any of you have seen this. Um, the coyotes and the badgers will hunt together. And um, it's really interesting because if a, if a prairie dog, for example, if it sees a coyote, it's going to go directly into the burrow. And the badger can go in the burrow after it and try to get it out so the coyote can get it. Um, it seems that the cooperative, the cooperation benefits the coyote slightly more than the badger. But uh, it's still, they still, it's a behavior that's documented. Um, significant habitat and prey loss due to conversion of grasslands to agriculture and livestock production have occurred that have limited the badger in its, uh, in its range and, and caused loss of, of uh, populations. Here is the coolest animal going, at least the ones in North America, the wolverine, gulo gulo. Uh, these guys, I don't know if you, any of you have been lucky enough to see one of these in person. I have seen one in Alaska. I got a, a glimpse of about five seconds of it before it ran off. Um, it's truly impressive. Here is their North American range. Uh, on the left is their range, and on the right, a more specific range. So you can see that they are boreal forest and also uh, subarctic and arctic tundra uh, specialists. Uh, they require snow, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, so on the right, the green areas that you see on that map on the right there, those are modeled habitat areas for wolverines in the lower 48 states. Okay, so that doesn't mean that they actually live there. That means that they could potentially live in those green areas. Okay, so you see that there's very little potential habitat in the lower 48. They've been on their way out in the lower 48 for decades. And, uh, and climate change is probably going to take care of the rest of them before long. Uh, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service continues to refuse to list them as endangered or threatened. Um, and, and they're, because the reason is climate change. And they don't want to list anything because of climate change. The only species they've listed, to my knowledge, due to just climate change is polar bear. And so they're very, they're, they're very hesitant, um, I've seen, to, to be able to list wolverine. I personally have tried to get wolverine listed for more than 20 years now, because we could see this happening. Could see this happening. Um, the numbers in the lower 48 are down under 300, probably somewhere about 250 maybe. And the effective population size of these guys is probably 30 to 40, which means effective population size means which of the, of the 250, which ones are breeding. Okay, so the effective population size is somewhere around 30 to 40, which is really bad. That, that bodes very badly for their future in the lower 48. So the scientific name Gulo is Latin for glutton. So that's, that's kind of where they get their name. They are the largest land-dwelling mustelid in the world. Uh, they have a reputation, and it's uh, a ferocity and strength reputation that's well beyond its size. Uh, you may have seen videos of them taking on grizzly bears. They'll stand up to a grizzly bear. Um, sometimes they won't, but sometimes they will. Um, and they do pretty well when they do. Um, their habitat, as I mentioned, it's boreal forest and subarctic and alpine tundra of the Northern Hemisphere. Um, they are whole Arctic, so that I forgot to put that on the slide here, but they do occur in Scandinavia, in Siberia. Um, so all the way around the globe, they're circumpolar um, polar Arctic species. They have extremely huge territories. Males can have a territory of 240 square miles. Just think about that. That's a huge territory. Probably one of the largest territories in any mammal. Uh, female territory is a bit smaller. Food habits. Now, these guys don't have to have live prey. As a matter of fact, they prefer carrion. So they're eating, they're looking for carcasses. Um, they also Eat, will eat live mammals if they get them. Um, anything from mice to moose, as far as size goes. They cache their prey also. So if they can't eat it all, like if they have an elk carcass, 
and they're eating it and they can't eat it, they will try to cover it up and save it for later. Um, interestingly, they're known to follow wolf and lynx trails to scavenge prey. So they know that if they find a wolf trail or a lynx trail, a lynx trail that could lead them to a carcass that they could potentially steal. Um, also interesting, I've seen a video of wolverines being used by common ravens to tear open carcasses. So a raven will get up in the air and it's flying over and it'll find a carcass and it'll start flying around looking for a wolverine. And it finds a wolverine and it starts calling to the wolverine and the wolverine comes over to where the, the raven is and finds the carcass and it tears it open and that allows the raven to feed because the carcass was not available to the raven until the wolverine does its job. So that, that's really cool. Here's how you trap a wolverine. So you don't use regular traps. You don't use leg hold traps. You don't use any kind of snare traps. You don't use anything. You have to use a log trap. And this is a big, thick log trap. Um, and this is how you catch them. So you have to build these giant log traps and put them out there. They're not easy to trap. And in the lower 48, they're really hard to trap because there's so few animals. So you would have to put a whole bunch of traps out just to have a chance to catch one. Economic importance to mustelids. Well, you've got the fur and trapping industry. Fur has got a very high economic value. We're mainly looking at species like mink, weasels, particularly ermine, which is a short tail weasel, uh, sables, river and sea otters and wolverine all have extremely valuable pelts. Uh, the sea mink I mentioned already was trapped to extinction before we even got to know it very well. Um, mustelids serve as mascots. So Bucky the Badger is the, the University of Wisconsin uh, mascot. We see, we see mustelids in movies. Marvel's Wolverine is a good example of that. Um, pet industry. Uh, Mustela putorius furo is the scientific name for the domestic ferret. And so you could go in any um, pet store and generally find ferrets for sale. Um, Petco and, and all of those other places, they have, they have ferrets. And also, this is one you, you really have a hard time putting a number on, rodent control. These guys are rodent hunters, by and large, you know, with, with a few exceptions, uh, particularly the weasels. Are, 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 are rodent control experts. And so um, the value for that is you really can't put a number on it, um, but, but that's, that's something that is of economic importance um, as far as mustelids go. Conservation issues for mustelidae. Um, the endangered species we have, the black-footed ferret, I mentioned that already, is endangered throughout its entire range. Um, and and I will mention that, the, that, that they've had problems with the reintroductions of ferrets simply because these guys do really well in captivity. They breed in captivity, but when you put them out in the wild, they all get killed. Uh, and so they're gonna, they're gonna get killed by coyotes. They're gonna get killed by badgers. They're gonna get killed by foxes. Um, and so they've had to adapt to be able to have a, 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 a soft release and a hard release. So they release them, uh, the soft release, where they have them in a pen and they, they leave them in the wild, but they're in a pen and they feed them. And so they have to get used to being outdoors and not in a, a captive facility. And then the hard release is when they actually release them. So they, they've got to get them adapted to uh, the wild before they can release them. That helps them a little bit. Anyways, that increases their um, survivability, but they have they have that to deal with. Um, sea otter is endangered, particularly the southern population, which is the one that occurs across along the uh, coast coast of uh, California, uh, and also down into northern Mexico. Um, and I also mentioned the sea otter is also protected by the MMPA, which is the Marine Mammal Protection Act. The sea otter is continued is considered a marine mammal. Okay, so unlike any other mustelid, um, a sea mink would have qualified also if it still was existent, in existence, but it's not. But the sea otter is a marine mammal. And so um, it's protected under the Endangered Species Act and the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Uh, the Pacific fisher is listed as endangered. Um, the, the Southern Sierra Nevada population only 
but it's proposed as endangered from Northern California all the way to Canada. And then the, Mar the Humboldt Martin, which is Northern California, that's listed as endangered also. And as I mentioned before, requires legal protection, Wolverine. Lower 48 state metapopulation is on its way out. And if it's not protected, it will be gone. And then you'll have to travel to Canada or Alaska to see a Wolverine if you could see one. Um, one of the biggest problems with Wolverine disappearing is that the females require snow. In other words, when they're making their den in the, in the springtime, they have to have a snowpack. And so if the females cannot find a snowpack, then they can't den. If they can't den, they can't reproduce. Okay, so as the snow, as the snow stays around shorter and shorter in the spring, that makes it harder for the female wolverines to find a snowpack to be able to den in. And so that's the problem. That's the, that's the primary problem that is that they're facing in trying to remain viable in the lower 48. Okay, Mostelid memes. So some of you may have seen this meme before. Um, I think I saw this meme like last year, the year before that, where this, this woodpecker was flying and they have a weasel riding on its back trying to eat it. So I, I, I thought that was really funny, but I found one that outdoes this one. And this one is just hilarious. I just found this in preparation for this talk. It's got Putin, uh, Putin is riding the back of the weasel, riding the back of the woodpecker. <laughs> <laughs> now that that's just great uh, but and then i have some other ones and and i had to put this in here because you can't do a talk on mustelids without talking about this guy the honey badger the honey badger don't care don't care about anything so the honey badger don't care is a, a really popular meme and and i've seen the one down on the bottom right here wolverine versus honey badger who would win and so they go through the whole um, possibilities of battle between those two species. They do that for a lot of different species, but this one happens to be two mustelids. So I thought I would include that in there as well. Honey badger don't care. Honey badgers are the coolest animals. If you've never seen a video of these guys, go on YouTube and, 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 uh, and search for honey badger. You, will, you won't regret it. All right, so that's that takes me to the end here. So thank you so much for everybody paying attention and I'll take any questions that we have time for. Thank you. Steve, you have been peppered with questions. There's a lot of questions. Um, Excellent. So, yeah, it is, it's exciting. So let me go back to the very beginning of the, of the chat. Um, Denise asked, what species are subnibian? Uh, so, you know, subnibian is more of a behavior. So if, if you have an opportunity and you live in an area where there's a lot of snow and you don't hibernate, then you can be subnibian. So, so um, least weasels, uh, short tail weasels, um, long tail weasels are not. Um, what else? Um, those are the two main ones that I'm thinking of right now, uh, simply because of the fact that they can they can use the subnivian to their advantage because they can breed because there are rodents that are active. And so if the rodents are active, the weasels can be active and they can take advantage of that and breed at a time when the, the environmental conditions are really harsh. Very good. Yep. Um, Cheryl has a question uh, I think we'd all like the answer of. Are all the, um, I pronounce it incorrectly, I'm sure. The, how do you say it, Steve? Mustelids? Mustelids. Mustelids. I have a different inflection. Uh, are they free ranging in Maryland or are some only in captivity, or like in breeding programs? Uh, they're all the ones that I, that I listed at the beginning that had asterisks next to them. Those were the Maryland species. Those are all free ranging. Now, but let me, I'll, I'll preface that. I like that question because there's a one caveat to that. And that is, well, 
it's not Maryland, but it's close. Front Royal, Virginia. Front Royal, Virginia has got a major population of black footed ferrets in captivity. So that's part of their part of their captive breeding program is the conservation center there at Front Royal. I think this might be what Bruce is referring to. I don't know what SCBI stands for, but he says they've been working to increase reproduction of biodiversity of the black footed ferret for 20 years. Yeah, that's the place. Program. Yep, yep. Yeah, that's the place. Yeah, if you ever get a, if anyone gets a chance to go visit that place, it's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. And and you, I, I was there the last time I saw, um, the last time I was there, I saw the ferrets. Very cool. He's, he's, yeah. Bruce said that two or three years ago, a litter was born to a founder animal that died over twenty years ago. Wow. Yeah, okay. they're using they're using a lot of really uh, creative techniques to be able to. Um, to minimize inbreeding. They don't want, I mean, inbreeding depression will really hurt the population badly. So they wanna to try to get a lot of genetic variation in the parental, um, in, in the parents. I have a question here from Laurel. Laurel, if you wanna unmute yourself because it sounds, uh, it looks like you asked that question at a, a pertinent part of the presentation. You know, Laurel asks, do you know whether the Fish and Wildlife Service has been able to retain this program despite all the cutbacks, or did they have to turn it over to other zoos? Patuxen had to give up the crane program. Uh, is that for ferrets? Yes, the black-footed ferret. I saw that, um, I know that the U.S. Fish and Wildlife had a program reading them and releasing them. I hope that they were able to continue doing their program, even though Patuxent had to stop the crane program. Right, to, to my knowledge, they're still doing it. Um, I just saw, I think I just saw some, some uh, news item about uh, reintroducing another, another group of ferrets to the wild. Um, I, with, their, with their budget problems, you know, that's gonna be always something that'll be easy to cut but I believe that they're still maintaining that program um, right now. Glad to hear it. Yep. Oh, Jenny said she saw a Wolverine when she worked in Idaho. Oh, uh, they, they are so cool. I forgot to mention one of the things that, you, that, that the Wolverine is so cool about is that if you've ever had a chance to see them either in person or in video is the way that they move through a forest. They hop, they jump. They actually jump like a kangaroo almost. It's, it's fascinating. Um, and Steve, maybe you know, because Bill knows everything Civil War, but he doesn't know why the Civil War soldiers from Michigan uh, call themselves Wolverines. <laughs> That's right. That, I mean, Michigan Wolverine is, is a, a really um, popular name, popular mascots, a mascot for the university, for the football team for the Civil War. Wolverines used to occur in Michigan. So, so they used to occur there, but not, not any time in the recent past. Mm. So, I mean, they were there. And I forgot, I'm glad you brought this up. Uh, we had a Wolverine in Maryland. It was found in the Cumberland Bone Cave. We actually had a species of Wolverine that occurred naturally in Maryland. And I don't remember the name of the, of the species name. It was Gulo. Something or other, I don't remember the specific name, but there are Wolverine bones in the Cumberland Bone Cave in Cumberland. But um, yeah, so so the answer to that question, I, I think it may be they may have used that as a as a mascot because they did occur in in Michigan in the 1800s. Very good. Uh, and Bruce, Bruce is like the never-ending um, source of information on otters and minks and things. This is a, it says there's some otter research going on at CERC. Lots of night camera trap work as well as identification uh, of communal latrines. Oh, cool. I did not know that. Um, cool. one, we had, actually, we have in Maryland, we have one of the river otter uh, world specialists at Frostburg, oh. Tom Surface. Tom Surface is a, a professor at Frostburg and he did his dissertation work on otters in Pennsylvania and then he then he came down to Frostburg and he does a lot of river otter work um, all over. 
Mary asks how you feel about ferrets in the pet, in the pet trade and in the fur trade. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I love ferrets. Uh, I know some people that keep, that have pet ferrets. Um, I don't personally have any, um, but I think they're really cool. Um, I don't, I don't think it's hurting anything necessarily. Um, I don't, I don't, they're not really, they don't really have a, um, a valuable pelt per se. Um, but, but economically, I mean, they're important in the pet industry and people do like them. Um, I don't think that's necessarily hurting anything as long as they don't release them into the wild. Mm -hmm. And, and Terrence asks, I'm kind of curious about this too. How big is a Wolverine? Big as a bear? Like what, what's the no. what compared to? Uh, let's see. Um, I'm just, I'm just gonna, just kind of guess. The, you want like length or, or, or weight? Oh, yes. So length, length <laughs> probably, probably maybe a, a meter, maybe, maybe a meter in length, maybe a little more. Um, weight probably. Oh, probably as probably as heavy as a maybe a a, a medium sized dog maybe. Wow, that's not very big when you think about. No, it. so no, they're not. They're not. They're not that big. Wow. I mean, they're they're much smaller than a grizzly bear. If you if you I've seen the video of the two uh, uh, fighting, and I mean the 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 wolverine is so much smaller than the bear. I'm gonna have to look at. Yeah, it's just, it's just, uh, you know, I don't think bears want to mess with wolverines. <laughs> um, let's see, uh, Susan asks, are pet trade ferrets indigenous to other parts of the world? Where did they come from? Europe, they came from Europe. Mm. Yep. And Melissa reminds us that Cirque is looking for volunteers to help with the latrine research. Oh, um, really? And, yeah, and there's a contact for, uh, she suggests contacting Allison Catwood at Cirque. Allison Catwood. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah. Very interesting. Yeah, that's very cool. Well, those are all the questions we have. Um, I learned a lot. Uh, well, it's a great it's talk. A, it's a real pleasure to be talking about a family of mammals that is this interesting. I mean, I just I don't know how you could get much more interesting than this family. They have so many legends and. Um, well, like you said, memes, it's pretty, they, they run the gamut. So yeah, I just cool. scratched the surface on the memes. I figured I'll just throw a few in there because of time constraints. But I mean, the ones that I found are pretty funny. Steve, have you ever seen that movie on video, on uh, YouTube of the guy with the, the trained ferrets that rat, um, hunts for rats? Yes, yes. <gasps> He's amazing. Well, and I, would also, amazing. I would also recommend the video on YouTube of the weasels. There's a guy in, in uh, the UK who has a weasel, um, his yard is set up for weasels and he's got all sorts of weasels running around and he breeds them. He's got little ones, big ones, and they're so hilarious to watch him. He's got, he's videotapes them moving around through the tunnels and through the grass. It's, it's just amazing. That's great, that's great. I can't remember the guy's name, but he's from the UK. That's enough information to punch into, um, YouTube. And everyone, oh, absolutely. Everyone is thanking you. I don't know if you're looking at the chat as well, Steve, but you're getting well, a lot not. of thanks. Um, it was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so much. I appreciate everybody joining me tonight. We, we are thankful that you were willing to give us your time. And I, I thank Terrence for reminding me to hit the uh, record button. <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> All right, well, I think that ends the presentation for this evening. Um, thank you, everyone. Try and stay cool out there. And um, we'll talk with you and visit with you soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Patty. Thank, everybody. thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye now. <laughs>